Shalom. This is Amir Tsarfati. I am from my home here in Galilee in Israel. Um, we just installed a few hours ago internet that is sufficient enough to be able to carry the upload of a video uh, broadcast. So he, if it's going to work, good. Um, uh, every time I come back from a red country uh, I, and, and I'm mandatory quarantine, I will still be able to uh, uh, teach and uh, give updates, which is wonderful. Um, <clears throat> just a little bit of what's going on in Israel right now so you understand why I'm locked up in my house. About uh, two weeks ago, the Prime Minister of Israel, uh, because of some very concerning numbers of uh, COVID-19 cases in Israel, especially among the ultra-Orthodox and the Arab communities of Israel, which are very tight communities that are not exactly famous in, uh, uh, let's put it this way, complying with the uh, laws and the, uh, and the uh, instructions of government, uh, the cases were so high, the number of cases was so high that uh, Israel had to go on another lockdown. This is the first country in the whole world that is a country that is on a lockdown. Lockdowns were used um, and are being used um, still on and off. Um, I believe it's a terrible way of controlling people, and I think that uh, nobody understands that the real deal is, has nothing to do with locking people in their houses. But I just want you to understand that um, what happened is that in the second wave of this COVID, um, Israel is the only country in the world that as a country is locked down. Um, in fact, um, we can see the second wave hit, hitting right now Europe in, in, in Madrid, in uh, in parts of uh, suburbs of London, such as Liverpool and others. In fact, let me show you something in Liverpool. Um, and again, this intimidation of you can't leave your house. Take a look at this bus stop. Um, this is a bus stop. This is a, um, uh, excuse me, it's a telephone uh, booth. Look what it says on it. Coronavirus, stay home to help us save lives. If you go out, you can spread it. People will die. Look at this thing. This is from yesterday in Liverpool, in, in the UK. Um, um, and again, having seen this thing now in the US, uh, where you can clearly see that this virus is being taken out of proportion, is being manipulating, uh, I mean, people are using it to manipulate people. And even the federal government, the U.S., is calling out the, the governors that are doing that manipulation. Uh, we can clearly see that uh, lockdowns are not effective because this is not how you, you help people to get rid of this thing. Now, let, me, let me tell you something. In the very beginning of this whole thing, I remember one of the videos that I, I gave was uh, how to have some health tips to go through this whole thing. And I showed you what I'm using. In fact, uh, I'll, I'll tell you, I'm using every day. I take vitamin D every day. I take magnesium every day. I take a vitamin C every day. I take uh, some other dietary supplement of other vitamins. And, of course, zinc. Every single day I take it. Look, I've been all across the United States. I spoke. Just a, a two weeks ago, I spoke in um, conferences where we had over, uh, in, in Chino Hills, we had over almost 3,000 people, other places, 1,200, 1,400 people. I signed hundreds of books. I shook thousands of hands, and I'm COVID-free. Um, the lockdown is because of other people, and the quarantine is because I came back from America. And America is considered a red country. And so just so you understand... What bothers me in this whole thing is that they're not telling people how to actually run healthier life and boost their immune system by taking all of these things. Um, they are actually locking people up in rooms in their houses, and they're telling them if you leave, people will die. This is this is the mindset that is going on right now. I think it's the wrong one. I think it's evil one. I think that. Uh, not all governments are doing that to manipulate the people. I believe that 
I honestly believe that much of what we see right now, and I can say that uh, with clean conscience right now, much of what we see now has to do with the U.S. elections. Much of what we are going through right now, all around the world, has to do with the U.S. elections. I'm saying that because now it's clear to me that uh, you know these lockdowns and uh, the whole manipulation of the virus and the number of deaths that are being cooked and the number of infect infections that they're always using on media, this is all a way to intimidate people to bring down the U.S. economy so Donald Trump will not be elected as U.S. president. And so the whole globalist agenda will go full force uh, under Biden and Harris. And I want to tell you, folks, that, um, look, uh, so many others admit that. In fact, even the, the actress Jane Fonda, she just said the other day on, 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 on television that COVID-19 is God's blessing to the liberals, to the left in America. Of course, this is not God's blessing to the liberals. This is China's blessing to the liberals. It is a Chinese virus that it was released from a Chinese lab. Um, much of it was funded by the previous U.S. administration, uh, that lab and all the researchers there regarding the coronavirus. And it was released in a timing that was known to several people, but not known to most people around the world. And of course, the devastating uh, uh, effect of it uh, on, on the economies in the U.S. But guess what? Check the markets in the United States today and you'll find out that they are breaking one record after the other. The economy is what they try to uh, ride on into the 2020 elections, November elections in America, and it is not working. The economy is recovering. The unemployment is going down to less than uh, 8% right now, which <laughs> you understand that it was way below that before the coronavirus, but it went up to over 20%, maybe even 25%. And now it's back down and it's going even lower and lower. And what we see in America right now, even beyond that, is that minorities are having their exit from the Democrat Party all the way to the Republicans and voting for Trump. People see that the, all the riots of Black Lives Matter and Antifa, which are not just an idea, it's an idea that has people and they shoot and kill also. Uh, but not only that, people see that there is no law and no order and there is a chaos and anarchy in the mind. and build up a socialist communist country. And all of that is with the greatest blessings of Russia and China. Make no mistake, Russia has no interest in Donald Trump being president. China has no interest in Donald Trump being president. Both bribe uh, uh, the, the uh, leaders and their, of the Democrat party and their uh, families, but it, is, it appears that it's not working. This is, by the way, why I believe that if Donald Trump is going to win, we might even see that their aggression will turn into a military operation rather than just uh, releasing viruses and, and just uh, doing stuff like that to cause the economy to come down. But I, I, I don't want to talk about that right now. Let, let's go back to the Middle East. Let's go back to Israel. Very interesting happened today. Uh, take a look at the, this uh, cargo ship. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a large cargo ship that just entered into the port of Haifa this morning, early this morning. And why is what's so important about this cargo ship? Uh, this cargo ship is a uh, cargo line that goes from all the way from India via the United Arab Emirates. And for the first time, it stops in Israel after the United Arab Emirates, bringing goods from the United Arab Emirates to Israel or taking stuff from Israel back to United Arab Emirates, first time ever. This piece is more active and warm and, uh, and, uh, and uh, I would say uh, amazing than the piece that Israel has with Egypt or Jordan. 
certain certainly with, with anything we ever had in the Pal with the Palestinians. This is amazing. We are watching right now the relationship between the Israel and the Gulf states growing, not just on paper, not just in ceremonies. Uh, and by the way, it's interesting because this morning, <laughs> Mohammed bin Ziyad, uh, bin Zayed, excuse me, uh, the leader of the UAE, just tweeted. This is the Arabic tweet, but that's him. That's the leader of the UAE, and he said, "This morning, I spoke with Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu." about advancing peace in the Middle East and, and et cetera, et cetera. What, what, this is phenomenal. The, you, you understand these people never even said the word, the name Israel, lest they would be attacked by the whole world. And we are seeing a 180 degrees turn shift. A lot of it has to do with the geopolitical uh, development in the entire Middle East, uh, which we will talk about even when it comes to the Caucasus in uh, uh, over there that connects Asia with Europe. Now, let me show you another thing that uh, just happened this morning. Uh, this is a map of the Mediterranean, and you can see this red highlighted area. On the very top, by the way, uh, this is Turkey. What is it? This is the new area that the Turks are now designating for their research vessel to look for gas and oil because it's all about gas and oil. Let me show you, um, just by the way, this area is now having the vessel and the vessel is escorted by warships and submarines and soon also helicopters and F-16s. The Turks are determined to find that which they cannot find. And that might also explain to you what the Turks are doing in Syria, Iraq, Libya, and as of last month, late last month, also in Azerbaijan. Now, the topic of this um, of this um, update today is, of course, what is going on and what is behind Azerbaijan and Armenia. Now, make no mistake. I am not here to take sides. I'm here to explain the, the the situation between the two. It's I don't believe it's even my right to take sides here because I don't even have a clue that of of the depth of this crisis and and what it means to each and every one of them. Uh, you know, it's so easy to criticize A or B when you are far away from them. Uh, but I will tell you that we are talking about this particular region. Take a look. In the lower map on the left, you can clearly see the area that later on in the big one is enlarged. And you can clearly see Armenia on the left, Azerbaijan on the right, Nagorno-Karabakh is the conflict area, is in red. And the area between Nagorno-Karabakh and Armenia has those stripes. And the whole thing is going back, of course, to 1924. Um, of course, way earlier than that. But in 1924, Stalin was the first one to give Nagorno-Karabakh autonomy, uh, the autonomous uh, uh, status there. Uh, of, of Armenians that are living in an enclave in the heart or in, in within the territory of Azerbaijan. So you can clearly see that Armenia is far on the left, Azerbaijan is far on the right. The area that we're talking about at all the fights are, as you can clearly see on the very top of the uh, Nagorno-Karabakh, uh, and then on the very also bottom of it, and the area that is with stripes, area that in uh, 1991 to 94, there was a, a war there and Armenia took over that place. And so now it's territory that Armenia took over in order to create sequence all the way from Armenia to Nagorno-Karabakh. So, so uh, what we see here is this. De jure, which is on the paper, according to the law, the international law, Nagorno-Karabakh and everything around it is 
the territory of Azerbaijan. De facto, which means the facts on the ground is that actually Nagorno-Karabakh is not in the hands of Azerbaijan. It is um, an autonomous area and everything beyond it is already taken by Armenia as well. So now you understand we're talking about an enclave in the heart of Azerbaijan, but it has been functioning as a as its own republic of Artsakh. And uh, everything beyond it towards Armenia is already area taken by Armenia as well. So you, you, you understand now that, uh, you know, in a way, when Azerbaijan tries to take it from an international law perspective, they, sh they can because it's theirs. But, but of course, it goes way deeper than that. And so now I would like to take you on a journey. Buckle your seat belts. It's going to be a two minutes long video. There is no audio, like you won't hear me talking. Uh, I'll be back after those two minutes. I want you to watch uh, the, um, I want you to watch the story of Nagorno-Karabakh of the last, uh, uh, I guess, uh, the last uh, century, ever since the dissolve of the USSR, the Soviet Union, and on. So, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to put that video right one on. I will take myself off and watch it for two minutes, and then we'll talk about it e extensively. Watch this, please. All right, so I hope uh, you saw this was a, a short two minutes long video of what is going on there. Uh, as you can clearly see, the area of Nagorno-Karabakh is an area that is heavily populated with Armenians. In fact, um, there was uh, almost what I call um, forceful population exchange by ways of... Uh, the Armenians, when they took over, uh, they they kicked all the Azaris out. And now when the Azaris are taking over, they kick all the Armenians out. And so you can clearly see that um, we are talking about uh, not much love between the two. Now, let, let me make it very clear. Armenia is Christian uh, 
nominal Christian and uh, Azerbaijan is Shiite Muslim, but it's not a Shiite Muslim country that is fanatic, not like Iran, for example. It's actually a secular Shiite Muslim country. It's very much open. Uh, in fact, it, it has great relationship with Israel. Uh, it just uh, in 2016, the Israeli prime minister visited uh, our, uh, Azerbaijan. Azerbaijan has just business deals with Israel to buy uh, weapons from Israel. Who knew that it's going to be part of a, a war with Armenia uh, right now? Armenia, by the way, Israel recognized Armenia immediately when it was established in 1992, but Armenia only this year opened an embassy in Tel Aviv. Only this year. In fact, in mid-September. And two weeks later, Armenia called back its ambassador back to Armenia because of the Israeli deals with Azerbaijan. So uh, what's going on here? Uh, are, are we friends or not? Israel would definitely help you also if you have deals with Israel. Look, America sells weapons. Russia sells weapons. France is selling weapons. The UK is selling weapons. Uh, and uh, the buyers are countries that need that weapon. Now, little did we know that what we sell is going to be used against Armenians, which, by the way, are our friends. But um, as I said, these are long-term deals that you cannot just stop because somebody is angry with you. Uh, but I will tell you, though, that Israel is not taking any side in this conflict. Uh, what, what we sold the Azaris, we sold them part of a, a deal that... Um, even uh, the U U.S. has with them and uh, uh, definitely the Russians. The Russians are selling to both sides, by the way. Make no mistake. Now, let me, let me take you all the way back, ladies and gentlemen, so you understand why this conflict actually reflects on the Middle East and on the future crisis that uh, is about to come upon us. As you could already see, we are talking about an area that is surrounded by the three major uh, countries. Uh, take a look at this. Okay, so you can clearly see Russia is on top, Turkey is on the left, Iran is far on the right. Russia, Turkey, and Iran are all around the area of the Caucasus where you can clearly see Armenia, Azerbaijan, and there's Georgia also there. And so you can clearly see that um, every one of them is trying to take advantage of this conflict and uh, cut some coupons. Now, make no mistake, I believe that uh, whoever started this conflict on um, September 28, I believe it's the Azerbaijanis. I believe that uh, they were greatly encouraged by the Sultan Erdogan to try now when America is losing interest in the Middle East. In fact, Israel is one of the only places they're still interested in. They're pulling out soldiers from Iraq and from Afghanistan and from other places. And uh, in the very Middle East, I'm not talking about the Gulf. And, um, and ladies and gentlemen, uh, Turkey wants to fill the void. And Turkey is now having its hands everywhere. Turkey is, is now ruling northern Syria. Turkey is ruling parts of northern Iraq. Turkey is ruling northwestern Libya, where it's creating terror enclaves, terror uh, pockets. And what Turkey is doing is very interesting. The Turks are taking uh, terrorists from Syria, and they fly them with cargo planes to wherever they want. These are like mercenaries. They, they, they boat, boat, put them on, on planes and they fly them to Libya. When they don't need them in Libya, they fly them now to Azerbaijan. And, and by the way, these mercenaries have no clue that they're going to fight in Azerbaijan. They were told that they're going to secure some oil and gas installations. When they got there, they were given a gun and said, go to fight. And some of them took videos and sent it. And you could see they are totally surprised. And this is not a good surprise. Um, so we're talking about uh, Turkey literally manipulating this whole thing to gain more and more control when they see that America is, is kind of leaving the Middle East. And it's very interesting because the Turks are making the first move. 
And because the Turks are making their move, Iran is now in a need to also do something. Russia is in a need to also react. And these two, three that don't like each other at all, the only reason they will come together is to invade Israel. They're not friends. Shiite Muslim Iran is not friends with Sunni Muslim Turkey and certainly not with Orthodox Christian Russia. They are not friends. They're actually having the uh, opposite interest almost everywhere. Russia op opposed Turkey in, in, in Syria. Russia opposed Turkey in Libya. Russia opposes Turkey now in the Azerbaijan-Armenian conflict. And again, that's, my, that's why I find it quite amazing that they, the leaders still meet together and the only time they will literally be together and have the same cause is when they come against Israel. This is phenomenal. Every time you see a picture of the Iranian leader the Turkish leader and the Russian leader in a summit, don't take it for granted. They don't agree on anything else. They don't love each other. They hate each other's guts. In fact, everywhere around the Middle East, they are not in agreement. Besides what? The future invasion into Israel. And for that, this alliance has been created. And it's super important that you understand that. Now, I'd like also to take you uh, to, uh, um, to also to explain that uh, the Azerbaijanis are and the Armenians are fighting right now. The ceasefire that was uh, reached two days ago did not last. They continue now. I just saw more videos of uh, Azerbaijanis uh, uh, um, un, unmanned uh, um, aerial UA, UAV, aerial vehicle, they are attacking uh, Armenian targets. So far, almost 300 people got killed. Uh, we're talking about major cities being attacked. Uh, I'm talking about Azerbaijani cities and Armenian cities that are being attacked. It's no longer just military against military. Um, and there is great, great hatred between the two the Muslims and the Christians uh, uh, in that part of the world. And each and every one of them say God is with us. And for them, this is a way to show uh, that it's about uh, uh, a, a religious thing, that whose God is going to win here in this thing. Now, Armenia doesn't have someone that uh, supports it uh, in a, in a way that Turkey is supporting Azerbaijan. Now, Russia is a little bit uh, embarrassed here because Russia sells to both weapons. But Russia seems to agree more with the Armenians right now. And so they declared a military exercise. And military exercise with Armenia means we're bringing forces into Armenia. We're going to keep them there. That's what they do in every other place around. Um, Syria... Uh, excuse me, uh, uh, Turkey is, as we speak right now, there are more airplanes bringing thousands of thousands of those mercenaries from Libya and from Syria all the way into, um, all the way into Azerbaijan, into the, bo the, 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 the border area. Iran is now, I have pictures and videos of, of caravans of armored vehicles and tanks that are going all the way to the Azerbaijani border. Make no mistake, Iran has 20% of its population Azari, Azerbaijani. In fact, Azerbaijan looks as northern Iran as its territory. In fact, uh, in, in the Eurovision Song Contest uh, a few years ago that was held in Azerbaijan, they showed the beautiful national, uh, impo nationally important places to the Azerbaijanis. And one of them was actually a place in Iran. They, they actually showed a place in northern Iran as if it's Azerbaijan. Iranians, although these both are Shiite Muslims, the Iranians actually take the Armenian side because they do not want the Azari minority to, to uh, rise up against the Iranian 
regime. Iran is too afraid now of internal problems. It has enough from the outside. You see, you need to understand, when Jesus said uh, wars will come and rumors of wars, nation against nation, of course, you, you probably heard that many times from me and other teachers, the words in the Greek are not nations as, as we say, but they're actually ethnic groups, ethnos versus ethnos. And it's interesting because in the Middle East, you can talk a lot about countries. You can talk about a lot about religion. But if you really want to understand who is against who and to whom the loyalty of a person belongs, you have to zoom in all the way to the tribal affiliation. And we are now seeing that uh, the Persians don't like the Azaris. The Azaris, uh, you know, Turkey sees the Azaris as Turks. Uh, Persian, uh, and, and you see, even though they are Muslims, one, one likes them, another. The Shiites don't like them, although they are Shiites, and the Sunnis like them, although they are Sunni Shiites. So sometimes the religious differences means nothing when you narrow it down to the tribal and ethnic affiliation. And this is important that you also understand this. No doubt, no doubt that uh, Erdogan is, uh, is, uh, is there to you know, continue the growth of the Ottoman Empire. He is desperate to find oil, desperate to find gas, Look, I just saw a video this morning in the other side of Libya that Turkey is not controlling, right next to the, the beach, people started digging and oil came out. Erdogan is always on the wrong side. And he always looked for that oil and he can't find it. And it, it's, uh, you know, he's, he's now, he knows that Azerbaijan is rich with oil, rich with gas. And so he says to himself, I'm going to help them. I'm going to send my generals to help them, my F-16s to help them, my uh, troops to help them, and I will also enjoy the benefits thereof. And uh, that's what we see that is happening over there as well. Now, all of that to say that energy, that oil and gas are the major, major issue in the Middle East, and that is going to be the reason for the war between Israel and the attacking coalition. And of course, that is important that you understand that. I also want you to know that uh, Erdogan has jihad in different places, as we said, in Libya. Uh, uh, he has also in Syria. He is sponsoring the Muslim Brotherhood in Gaza. And uh, of course, the jihad, the Islamic jihad and Hamas. Uh, it creates pockets of jihads, jihadists all around. Now, let's talk about Armenia for, or for a minute. Look, as I said, Armenia, uh, let, there's more Armenians outside of Armenia than inside. In Armenia itself, there's only 3 million people. But there's huge Armenian population in different parts of the world in Australia, New Zealand, and of course in America and Canada and other places. In fact, some of the biggest celebrities such as the Kardashians and the, the, the singer Cher and others, they're all Armenian descent. In fact, Kim Kardashian just uh, had a video yesterday where she wants to, the whole world to stand with Armenia and with Artsakh, this Republic of Nagorno-Karabakh against the atrocities of the Azaris. So there's no doubt Armenians have a louder voice and a better PR around the world. Now, let me, regarding Israel, let me make it very clear. The Armenians outside of Armenia are much friendlier towards Israel than the Armenians that are in the Middle East. There's Armenians in Jerusalem, but they consider themselves more Palestinians than friends of Israel. There's Armenians uh, in Lebanon. Uh, in fact, one of the, uh, Emil Lahoud, one of the uh, ex-presidents was part Armenian. Uh, there's Armenians, by the way, make no mistake, the, the supreme leader of Iran has Az, uh, Azari blood in him. So you see that uh, the Azari and the Armenian 
uh, blood, blood flows in the veins of leaders in the Middle East area. Um, and again, as I said, only on September 17th of this year, Armenia finally opened a, an embassy in Tel Aviv. Only now. Uh, after we acknowledged them and we had diplomatic relations with them since 1992. Um, I will be honest with you, in the region, Azerbaijan was much friendlier towards Israel than Armenia. In the region. Outside, Armenians, of course, are very friendly with Israel in the, in the bigger picture. But in the narrow Middle Eastern conflict, Azerbaijan has been very, although they are Muslims, but they are secular Muslims, and they're not practicing Shiite Islam in the way that they want to destroy Israel. In fact, they they, they have great... Uh, uh, look, let's, let's not hide it. Israel's interest in Azerbaijan is, of course, the proximity of Azerbaijan to Iran. It gives Israel eyes and ears to what's going on in Iran. I will not tell you everything that Israel has in Azerbaijan in regards to Iran, but I can tell you this is one of the reasons the Iranians are actually on the Armenian side and not on the Azari side, because Israel is very good friends with Azerbaijan. I can also tell you folks that um, even though, again, Armenia just called back its ambassador two weeks after they opened the embassy, but Armenia wants to stay friends with Israel because Israel is held today as a regional uh, superpower. A, because uh, we have the greatest military equipment and technology and medicine and in agriculture and everything, but also, uh, also because uh, we do have uh, also energy that uh, uh, can help them as well. And so what I'm trying to say is that uh, in this situation, um, I don't think Israel needs to choose sides. Now, some of you might say you need to choose the side of the Armenians because they also had a Holocaust that caused in World War I by the Turkish army, which, by the way, I agree. In World War I, the Turkish military slaughtered. It, it, it was a genocide of the Armenian population in their territory at that time. There is no doubt about it. But I can also tell you, that the Armenians, and, and again, I don't want to offend Armenians outside of Armenia, but in Armenia, they actually said, hey, we went through a Holocaust first, and the Jewish Holocaust was played, overplayed. There were not six million that died, and then the Jews controlled the world. These voices came from Armenia and from Armenian people in the Middle East. Now, you don't hear that from Armenians elsewhere. But in the Middle East, when you have Armenians in, in places full of Arabs, they always took the Arab approach. They always took the, the approach that was anti-Israel and therefore almost denying the Jewish Holocaust. And so this is exactly why I would say um, uh, Israel um, is also uh, um, not exactly... I mean, we did not press the Armenians to have embassy open. Um, um, but again, again, you have to understand, if you don't live in the Middle East, you will never understand why people have to take a specific identification to, in order to survive. I believe that Armenians that were surrounded by Arabs, they needed to take the Arab narrative and the Arab side in order to live among the Arabs and survive among the Arabs. So... I, I can understand why it, it happened, but I must say that on the other side, Azerbaijan never was hostile towards Israel, never uh, had any anti-Semitic uh, approach towards Israel at all. And so it's not like you should be surprised that Israel is actually helping the Muslims and not helping the Christians here, because it's not exactly... Islam versus Christianity and Judaism has to choose. This has nothing to do with that. This is all about interests in the Middle East. And Israel needed Azerbaijan, A, because Azerbaijan had oil and, and, and they gave and we, they sold it to us in the past. But also, of course, remember, 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 all the big change that we see now in the Middle East is due to the Iranian situation. Iran 
And make no mistake, by the way, the, UN, the uh, UN Atomic Energy just announced yesterday that Iran is breaching the agreement and is enriching uranium faster and in higher grade than it is allowed. Uh, I want to hear condemnation or sanctions from Europe or Russia or the UN. No. The only country that is sanctioning uh, Iran is the United States. Donald Trump is the only leader that understands the cards that the Iranians are playing, and he is reacting the way they never expected, and they are, they are very much uh, uh, devastated. The Iranian real, the last report I gave you, it just crossed the 300,000 real for one US dollar. Now it's almost 320,000 real, almost 317,000 real for a one US dollar. The sanctions work. Now, new sanctions are now on 18 banks in Iran. And we are now, the Americans are now crippling the Iranian way to even move money with, within banks uh, in and out of Iran. And that's, crippling even more so the Iranian economy. And the Iranians, what are they doing? New missiles, new submarines, new airplanes, new boats. It's all about military, military, and military. And they really don't take care of their own people. Now, um, this is pretty much what's going on in Armenia and Azerbaijan. Again. Remember, Nagorno-Karabakh, territory that has been disputed for the longest time. They declare themselves as the Republic of Artsakh. Uh, de facto, Armenia controls it, but the Eura, international law, it belongs to Azerbaijan. No doubt, Turkey is stirring the pot, wanting them to have a war there in order for Turkey to be able to have a footstep in Azerbaijan and enjoy the oil and enjoy the gas and enjoy the wealth and expand the way Turkey wants as part of the vision of uh, Erdogan to create a new, old new Ottoman Empire. We see that Iran is there. We see that Russia is there. We see that there is a, it's all about energy. It's all about control. It's all about taking over. And this thing is going to play a significant role in the near future whenever they will come against Israel. So make no mistake, what we see, the Syrian conflict has now moved to the Caucasus. By the way, um, in the Greek mythology, I'm not a big fan of it, but in the Greek mythology, the Caucasus is the area that is the pillar upon the whole world is standing. That's how they say it. In fact, uh, they even believe that the world peace depends on that area because Noah's Ark came to Mount Ararat, which is in the Caucasus area. So uh, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, people that are looking at that part of the world as the indication for uh, war or peace in the entire world. That's how they see it. So when they fight, they fight for the whole world, not just for their own place. And there's a lot of emotions, a lot of religious uh, emotions there. And again, whose God is going to win? That's how they uh, they present it at this moment. Uh, it's a religious spirit there in different uh, garments. And um, now I, I have a, a, a word for all of you. You know, Behold Israel is dedicated to pray for a, the right government to be elected and the right president to be elected in the United States. We started a 30 days countdown towards uh, November 3rd election. We believe that the uh, platform of the Republicans is, is the most biblically based platform when it comes to pro-life, when it comes to pro-family, pro-freedom, pro-Christianity, and pro-Israel. We believe that with all of our hearts. We see exactly what the other side suggests when it comes to abortion, when it comes to religious uh, freedom, when it comes to Israel, when it comes to reviving the Iran deal, when it comes to all of these things. We, we already see where it's going. We know that the Chinese are pushing heavily. Um, now it's the virus and the financially, uh, they, they, they hope that Trump will not go there. Um, 
today the hearing for Amy um, uh, uh, I forgot her name um, Barrett Amy Barrett uh, to be uh, uh, the next justice in the Supreme Court of the United States today it started I can already see how the left is going to shred her to pieces for what for believing in God and for being a Christian you'll see they'll say that she's narrow-minded they'll 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 tell the world that uh, she doesn't understand the liberal progressive uh, world around she is not a good fit to enter into Ruth uh, Bader Ginsburg's uh, shoes Ruth Bader Ginsburg was a progressive and she's not look the Democrats live in this uh, la la land that uh, that uh, Ruth B Bader Ginsburg has to be cloned no no that's not how it works. When somebody passes away, the president not, uh, is appointing a new one to replace him. The new card that the uh, Democrats are using right now is packing the U.S. Supreme Court. They believe that Donald Trump, by, at, by adding a Supreme Court judge uh, justice before the elections, he's packing the Supreme Court. Now, make no mistake, and I was not aware of that, honestly, I was not aware of that. I didn't even know that there's, a, there's an issue like that in America's constitution. Uh, but uh, um, so uh, I asked a friend of mine, what is this whole packing thing? Why are we asking Biden if he's going to or not? And then he explained to me this. The Congress can determine to add more judges to su the Supreme Court. There is no set number in the constitution. And if there is a Democrat House, Senate, and President, they can expand the number of judges to 12 or 15 or however many. And then they would put liberal judges in those new positions, ensuring a liberal Supreme Court for a very long time. The only president who tried it was Franklin Roosevelt, and he was shut down by both parties. So that's packing. And they are accusing Trump for packing by just replacing someone uh, who passed away. That's not packing. What the Democrats are planning is this. Make no mistake. If th they hope to win the elections in both houses and uh, presidential elections, they're going to do that. Now, when, when uh, Biden was asked, are you going to pack? He says, you will not know until after the elections. He says that. The public does not need to know that. You're too dumb. By the way, through his answer, you can understand that that's their next card. The next card is to, uh, if we win, we're going to make sure America will stay and even become more and more progressive and liberal uh, for generations. And so they're trying to play the card as if, Trump is packing the Supreme Court, which is not the, the case. He's replacing one for one that just passed away. That's it. And I want to tell you, folks, we are going to see a lot of tricks, a lot of stuff that will, is going to be pulled out of the Democrats' hats every single day. And I can tell you, folks, I can tell you that while the Democrats are doing that in the political arena, there's more and more concerns that uh, military uh, operation might be uh, on the move if uh, pr President Trump will be uh, elected. Now, they're trying to cause a situation where on September 3rd at night, you will still not know who the president is. In fact, they're trying to tell you that it's going to take long. Uh, it's going to take weeks because of the mail-in ballots and all of that. I want to tell you something. My prayer... My prayer is that it's going to be such a landslide victory on the 3rd of November that it will be so obvious that there is no need to wait for anything. And I, I, my biggest prayer is beyond the president that I want uh, Trump to, to, to remain, is that both houses will be now finally with Republican majority uh, and 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 and. And I will tell you this, uh, that governors and mayors of the failing Democrat Party will be, uh, will be removed. 
and change with Republican nominees. And I'll tell you why. Look, we've seen there's there can be a great president such as Trump and still a horrible governor uh, in California or in New York. And they are responsible for the death of many and for the loss of business of many and for the shutdown of churches of many. And, and this is something that the federal government cannot do much against because the Constitution of America is so that there is a limit to the intervention of the federal uh, government here. And this is why it's important that beyond having great president, great Congress, there has to be also great state leadership. Um, and California and New York are suffering greatly right now because of those horrific liberal progressive governors that and mayors that they have in different places. And I was praying today, and I, Lord, which uh, which portion of scriptures do you have me to to share today that may uh, maybe somehow relate to what's going on in America right now? Makes no mistake, America America's case is the world's case. If the wrong president enters the White House, the entire world is going to suffer from it. The Iran deal and Everything you see that came after that and tons of terrorism that was sponsored by Iran that has billions of dollars in cash right now, all of that is because of a wrong president in the, right, in the White House. Or not the wrong, God did allow it, but of a bad one, a bad choice of the American people. And they thought, you know, it would be nice to have a, a black president. It was the most corrupt president in the history of America. And uh, black people even say that. It's not something that you can hide. The whole collusion, the Russian collusion, was made up in the Oval Office by Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton and the heads of the Secret Services that colluded against the newly elected President Donald Trump before he even got into the White House on January of 2016, uh, 2017. So it's very, very interesting uh, to see that. Now, let me... Let me so... As I was praying, uh, what I had uh, from the Lord is that, look, uh, America, in a way, is the superpower of this world. And uh, so to speak, like the king um, of, of, of uh, amongst the nations right now. And I'm, re I'm reminded of how Solomon was the king of Israel in the heights of the glory of Israel with the largest territory Israel ever had. And uh, when he built the house of God in 1 Kings chapter 8, we see that, uh, look what Solomon says. Solomon in verse 22, Solomon stood before the altar of the Lord in the presence of all the assembly of Israel, and he spread out his hands towards heaven. And he said, Lord God of Israel, he said, there is no God in heaven above or on earth below like you who keeps your covenant and mercy with your servants who walk before you with all their hearts. You have kept what you promised your servant, David, my father. You have both spoken with your mouth and fulfilled it with your hand as it is this day. Therefore, Lord God of Israel, now keep what you promised your servant David, my father, saying, you shall not fail to have a man sit before me on the throne of Israel. Only, watch this, only if your sons take heed to their way that they walk before me as, as um, that they walk before me on the throne of Israel, only if your sons take heed on their way that they walk before me as you have walked before me. And now I pray, O God of Israel, let your word come true, which you have spoken to your servant, David, my father. And look what he says. But will God indeed dwell on the earth? In other words, will God interfere in the, in, 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 in the manners of men? Look what he says. Behold, heaven and the heavens of heavens cannot contain you. How much less this temple which I have built. 
You regard the prayers of your servants and his supplication, O Lord my God, and listen to the cry and the prayer which your servants is praying before you today. I believe that tons of Americans are turning to God nowadays. I believe that there is rallies, prayer rallies, fasting, praying like never before. I've never seen anything like that all across America. And I believe, I want to believe that this is, look, we are the restrainer, the, the Holy Spirit in us, the restraining power. We are, we are telling God, this is you doing that. You are faithful to your promise to your children that if they walk in your way. Now, you're probably going to say, wait a minute, America is not walking in God's way. I will tell you this many times for the sake of those who did walk in his way. He held his judgment from taking place over the entire nation. But I want to remind you one thing, folks. This was chapter 8 of First Kings. And uh, I want to remind you that in chapter 10 already, we can see Solomon departed from God's ways. And uh, it says, but King Solomon loved many foreign women, as well as the daughters of or daughter of Pharaoh, women of Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites, Sidonites, and Hittites, from the nations of whom the Lord had said to the children of Israel, You shall not intermarry with them, nor they with you. Surely they will turn away your hearts after their gods. And Solomon clung to these in love, and he had 700 wives, princes. So you see, the Bible says, that basically in verse 6 of chapter 10, the Bible says, And Solomon did evil in the sight of the Lord and did not fully follow the Lord and did his father as this is Father David. When the leadership in America is godly and it is tuning the nation towards godliness. And by the way, the the, the judge, the hearing of Amy uh, uh, Barrett today, godly woman, godly family to be appointed to the Supreme Court that is, is being manned by godly people, slowly, slowly. This is when the leadership is godly and the Lord is blessing. You, you can see the blessing. Still, people want to come to America because it's much better to live there than in where they come from. Why do you think everybody wants to go there? Because it's worse? No, because it's much better. But I believe that the minute the leadership in America is going to be changed with a leadership that is seeking other gods, other places, and they do evil. The leadership, I see Solomon as almost as, as a way of a leader, that represents the leadership here. Then, of course, it's the Lord said to Solomon, of course, uh, in verse 11, he said, Because you have done this and have not kept my covenant and my statutes, which I have commanded you, I will surely tear the kingdom away from you and give it to your, uh, uh, to your servant. Nevertheless, I will not do it in your days. Ladies and gentlemen, I, I, can, I can tell you this. America eventually will step down from world podium as world leader. And that's because of America's choice to follow other gods, to follow other deities, the religion of climate change, the religion of COVID-19, the religion of LGBTQ, the, re the religion of, of, of uh, progressive mindset, secularism, and... Uh, also anti-Semitism. I want to tell you something. This is where the nation of America will go once the leadership will dictate that. Look what eight years of Obama in the White House did to that nation. My prayer is that the prayer of Solomon is going to be honored as the prayer of the leaders in America today will be honored for the whole nation of America. And as long as I see that the leadership in America is calling for prayer, is calling for churches to be open, is calling for to turn around and to turn away from sin and to repent, when I see that, 
that they are against the killing of the unborn. They are against anything of anti-Semitic nature. They are against the dissolving of, of, of uh, um, uh, family uh, values. Um, this is when I still see hope for America. And I, I, I have peace in my heart that as long as this is going to be the voice of the leadership in America, the Lord will keep his promise to keep them in place. The minute the leadership will turn away from God, the whole nation is going to suffer. And the blessing and the hand of God will be removed. And uh, we will see that. So, um, you know, watching those two debates, I'm watching Biden and Harris, and I'm seeing First of all, I've never seen people lying through their teeth so much. Even Harris quoting Lincoln was a was a lie. Lincoln never said what she said he did. But everything was lie. But you see the smile and you see the arrogance and you see almost I felt like the enemy, Satan himself, is smiling through them, luring the people. Come vote for me. I'm the new face. I, I know better. Look, whenever the question of climate change came, felt so great you know this is our thing you know this is our thing although everything was debunked you know according to those people the, our planet was supposed to be destroyed already 10 years ago did you know that even after pulling out of the paris climate agreement us is still leading in in reduction of emission of 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 those toxic gas do you know that do you know that and yet you kept the jobs and kept the economy going without destroying your country for the sake of what? For the sake of those countries that continue to pollute it and nobody hold them accountable. Let me tell you this. It's all fake and it's all baloney. And I can tell you that those religions of uh, climate change and, you know, gender confusion and and redefinition and all of that. These are things that eventually will bring down every country around the world. If that's these are the gods that they start worshiping. And uh, I pray with all of my heart for U.S. leaders uh, to stand strong on the Word of God, on prayer, on repentance, on the rights of the unborn. I pray for Judge Amy Barrett to. Be approved by the Senate as quickly as possible. And uh, I pray for President Trump to not just have a victory, but to have a landslide victory and to have both houses under Dem uh, Republican control. And uh, for many terrible mayors and, 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 and governors to be replaced by good ones that love the people and love God. So let's pray. Father, I thank you so much for your word. I thank you so much that your word is still true today. It is a mirror of what the world is going on even today. Your promises are still the same. Your blessings are still the same. Your warnings are still the same. And uh, we pray that the same thing you uh, spoke to King uh, Solomon when he inaugurated the temple is the same thing you will also do and speak to the American people now as they go to their elections. I pray, Father, also for the situation in uh, the Caucasus. I, I, I pray that uh, uh, the war between Armenians and the Azar Azaris, Azerbaijanis will come to an end so innocent people will not lose their life for nothing. I pray, Father, that uh, the forces of evil uh, will be restrained uh, as long as we are here, as long as we are here, we are not going to allow that to control. We know that uh, our days are numbered. We know that uh, soon and very soon you will take us out of here. But until then, Father, let us pray for righteousness. Let us expose evil and let us not be take part of that evil. Uh, Father, I pray that uh, your will will be done. Thank you for all your promises and for all that you are. And we ask all of this in the matchless name of the Holy One of Israel, Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus, we pray. 
יברכך אדוני וישמרך, יאר אדוני פניו אליך ויחונך, יישא אדוני פניו אליך וישם לך שלום. The Lord bless you and keep you, the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you, the Lord lift up his countenance towards you and give you his shalom, his peace. That peace that surpasses all understanding that can come only from the Prince of Peace, who is also the Lord of Peace, who can give you peace now and forever, here and everywhere. His name is Yeshua, is our salvation, is our redemption. He is the Lamb of God, the Prince of Peace, Emmanuel, and he's the Lion of the tribe of Judah that will return with us to reign and rule and destroy the evil one with the breath of his mouth. In his name we pray. Amen. <laughs>